All right, here we go with a special on the road edition of In the Zone with Matt Barnes, man. Yeah. We at your house in the man, LA area. It, man. Nah, I appreciate it, man. Thanks for having us over here. Like the, the Tupac shirt yes, and that's my guy. you got some great art yeah. all over the place. Yeah. Tu you, Tupac, your favorite rapper? Tupac is my favorite human. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, definitely rapper, but I just think, you know, he was so much more than a rapper. Um, but yeah, I just have cool, I'm a big fan of kind of helping people expand their brand and their business. So yeah. I find local artists off Instagram, kind of all over the United States. And now they want to send me stuff, but I'll buy stuff and post for them and kind of ho help grow their gathering and get yeah. other athletes to do the same thing. So I was fortunate enough to have some cool stuff. Yeah, that's some great stuff, man. Great shots. Um, so you reach out to people. You just reach out yeah, to them? Yeah, I'll DM them. They must be shocked. I'll DM, yeah, they are, definitely. <laughs> it, it's really cool, you know what I mean? Because, you know, they're really authentic. And I just think music and art are just something I wish I can do. It, I, it, it's such a creative space and uh like i said i just love being able to help people are you into like <laughs> do you do any art or music or anything like that? i buy it and listen to it yeah that's about that's it. it you, know, you I, never I, rapped or anything no, back I, in the I day? respect I, I respect the craft too much to try to cross over like that you know so I mean, even I love back music. in the day though when never. you was a kid you didn't run never no, i just knew i was an athlete that's what yeah. i did so i wasn't i respect each craft too much to try to cross over and, and do some stuff, stuff like that because i don't have the time to be good at it yeah what do you think about the players that rap some guys can really rap you know, some guys could like Dame Lillard could really, Lilla could really rap. You know, Stephen Jackson could really rap. You yeah. know, if it's something you can do, do it. It just wasn't really for me. Yeah, yeah. You heard Lonzo's mixtape? Yeah, he, yeah. He, I haven't. I just heard snippets, but uh, you know, I like it. You know, so, what I mean, if he, he's a talented kid, man, and I, and I and I really think the basketball side is starting to show, and I'm happy for him. He's playing well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that? I mean, you play with a lot of great players. Having a teammate like that, I don't want to compare it to the greats that you <clears> play with. But having a guy that's straight trying to pass and get mm -hmm. you involved, how much do guys enjoy that? It's special. It's special to be, to be able to affect the game without necessarily scoring a bunch of points. You know, it takes a special individual. You know, I was blessed to play with a lot of them. Um, Steve Nash, uh, Chris Paul, um, guys that really can do either or but or would rather pass. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So someone like Lonzo is a special talent and I think he kind of got it off to a slow start because one it's just a new experience he's 19 20 but then all the trash talking with his dad in the world yeah. you know what I mean so I think everything's kind of simmered down and you're starting to see him kind of get it a little bit but he's gonna be a special player you got two boys they play yeah are they young I'm yeah. nine right yeah. twins yeah will you be like a LeVar ball dad or? no I mean I don't <laughs> don't get me wrong I like what LeVar is doing I mean he loves his boys you yeah. know what I mean and he realized he has something special you know I don't agree with everything he does but I'd much rather be there doing that than yeah. not be around doing nothing yeah uh, my boys I'm different you know to each their own um, you know, I just have a different way of going about it and, and motivating them and getting them to do stuff and teaching them about life. You know what I mean? So, uh, but I'm definitely going to be a dad that's very hands on. So we were talking earlier <laughs> um, before we got on the camera. Kevin Love came out with a big article today in the Players Tribune. Really good article, insightful about kind of mental illness among athletes. And he said he had a couple panic attacks during games and um, he's seeing a therapist and stuff. And you were saying how, you know, people don't appreciate yeah. what athletes oh, man. go through. We go through a lot, and I think that because we make a lot of money, people just expect us to be superhuman, mm -hmm. and we're not. We're, we're just like everyone else. We just happen to be good at something that, you know, pays a lot. But I can completely understand. I saw, you know, with Kevin and with DeMar DeRozan speaking yeah. on it, I, I think throughout sports, because <clears throat> we, especially in basketball, you know, I played through the death of my mom. The day after my mom died, I played uh, just to kind of, wow. you know, stay, get it off my mind. I went through a very public divorce. I went through a very public fight with Derek Fisher, you know, yeah. but, but, but all this and people are saying good, bad and indifferent. I'm still dealing with emotions all inside, but, it, but I have to be able to put those away because I'm, I'm playing basketball still. You know what I mean? So we have to kind of suppress a lot of things. and. A lot of times it doesn't get to come to the surface and you know, you'll see one of us either go off or go into a depression or go into, you know, you don't know what direction people go. So it's, it's definitely a serious issue in pro sports. Do coaches, I mean, are you able to go talk to anybody? It's or, hard. Yeah. I think it's hard because as a man, you don't want to admit you have, you know, it's kind of yeah. like a pride thing. Yeah. You know, I, but I can't really, cause I've, I've been fortunate enough to never have it. You know, I've had, <laughs> I've had anger issues up and down, <laughs> but I, I've never, had an anxiety attack or really had any type of depression, you know what I mean? I just, I dealt with my stuff a different way, but I, so I can't speak to their nature, but 
it's just tough, you know, it, it, but it, I definitely something that needs to be talked about and addressed, and I'm glad these guys are brave enough to do it. Yeah, it, it really is good. Um, so you retired in, officially in December. Mm -hmm. um, what if, what's the one thing that stood out to you about the league since you've retired? Anything in particular? The refs. God, so what's, yeah, so what's the deal? bad, man. <laughs> They're so, so bad. The I just, players aren't just bugging. No, I just, now that I'm not in it and I'm not emotionally tied to it, I, I still get so irritated by refs because I, <laughs> I think it's so much ego they have. I think it's a prideful thing. And with all due respect, they're doing a very tough job. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. Their job is tough. But it's to the point where you can't say anything to them. You know what I mean? Especially these young refs. I mean, they're so tea happy. You know what I mean? And you got to think, you have kids, you know, and I have kids. I know when my kids are getting excited to watch a game or go to a game that night, they're not saying, Daddy, I can't wait to go see these refs give players teas. <laughs> like, they're going to say, I can't wait to go get ready to see KD or yeah, Steph or yeah. LeBron. Like, they, they want to see these players. And these refs are taking everything so personal and teeing these people out and throwing them out messing up the whole flow of the game, it, just, it really bothers me. So that's a lot different from when you came. Right, and it bothered me. I mean, I lost a lot of money <laughs> while I was playing because of it. But now that I have, you know, I'm completely disconnected, the refs are terrible. Wow, wow. When do you think it went, when did you, well, you were playing, maybe you didn't notice. I think with the older generation, you know, when you started losing Joey, well, you know, I played 14, 15 years, yeah. you know what I mean? So I came in with the Dick Bavettas and Joey Crawfords and all these, you know, the, these legendary referees that you know we would still get into it but it would we would get into it they you know you can talk to them forth. you can right. yell at them they would yell back at you and, and keep it moving but these refs if you look at them wrong or if you do a just it's it's ridiculous yeah. like I talked to Draymond all the time and when he got his I think his 14th the other night where he just he blocked someone's shot and just you know got the crowd going they gave him a T I'm like that's bullshit. like yeah. what are they doing like you can't yeah. you're taking the emotion out of the game I feel like the league has <clears throat> Not like you said, not as bad as the refs, but the when the league, like if you dunk on somebody and you stare at them, it's crazy. That shouldn't be a team. No, it's it, they're taking the emotion out of the game, kind of like when football a few years ago you couldn't celebrate. Mm -hmm. Like yep. when you're doing, like it's emotion out. We're not robots, we're emotional humans, so we're going on a roller coaster throughout the game. So when something good happens, it, it's okay to celebrate, it's okay to yell in someone's face, it's okay. Like how KG used to dunk and yell in everybody's yep, face or yep. Shaq would. Like, you got that's part of it. Get them back. If there's yeah. a problem, get them back. But don't give someone a T for being emotionally involved in the game. Now, what do you say to the fans who say, "Man, the, the players <clears throat> complain about every call. Because Nobody it, ever makes a foul." It, it, it's tough because they're right because we feel like we don't <laughs> foul, you know. But I mean, guys know they do foul, but it's just. And I get it because the NBA wants it to be a scoring league. You know what I mean? They want scores in the upper, you know, the 120s yeah. because, you know, dunks and highlights drive revenue. It, so it's a whole money situation, but it's really taken out the purity of being able to guard someone and play basketball. Yeah. So everything is a foul now. So really like, okay, we obviously we do commit fouls sometimes, but sometimes we're really just playing good, hard defense guarding these the best players in the world and it's a little nudge or a little bump and they call everything yeah yeah so it, it's hard because you're so competitive like god if you can't do that how am i supposed to stop kd how am i supposed to stop steph if i can't do anything yeah you yeah know? so well you've been since you've been retired you still making news you know a lot of news <laughs> <laughs> Run through a, a few things oh, um you recently said though in an instagram post this is great you want to be a billionaire by age 50. Right. So tell me, tell me about that. Um, just, I use the NBA as a platform. I, don't get me wrong, I loved every minute of it, every game, every second. It was such a blessing to be able to play, to get paid to do what I love. You know what I mean? I wasn't supposed to make it. I wasn't the best player on my UCLA team. I, wasn't, uh, I was a second round pick, but just my heart wouldn't let me fail. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So to be able to survive, and be on as many teams and be able to coincide and mix and all the stuff I did. I just, through all that, I use it as a platform to meet people. I mean, I was meeting everyone on the court side and I was okay. going to lunch and dinners with people that I know that can help me down the line. And I really took that to heart. And I think that once people got to know who I was as a person, like, man, you're not that same person on the court. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So they kind of <laughs> were able to separate the two knowing that, cause I've been everything from a thug to a, a bully to a dirty player. <laughs> But I'm just a competitor, like I'm a football player playing basketball, you yeah. know what I mean? So when you get a chance to meet these people and they see the real side of you, they're like, whoa, you know what I mean? And I can talk and I can understand business. And so I've just been able to use all those connections to this next step. Were you, <clears throat> did somebody tell you, Matt, if you get to the NBA, use that stuff? Or was that just something you did instinctively? Um, it, was, it was a hustle instinct. 
You mean going, I, I started, I learned it at UCLA because okay. UCLA is so well connected. So just starting to realize that all these people, whether I make it or not, all these people are, 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 are people in position and power. And uh, you know, if, if you make friends, you never know who somebody is. So I'm always cool with everybody. Ever, whoever meets me off the court is like, man, you're so cool, uh -huh. you know what I mean? So, cause you never know who you're meeting. And yeah. you never know if they're gonna be able to help you down the line or if you can help them. So I just always remember that and just carried that through college and through my career. So you have some businesses. What are some of the businesses? <sighs> man, I'm, in, I'm invested in, in um, some oil. I made a big oil investment that's it's gonna be, uh, Life changing. So really? that was good, yes. Is that here in America? Yeah, or it was in, actually in Bakersfield. Wow. In wow. Bakersfield. So I took a drive. I was driving from LA back to my house in Berkeley, and uh, I met through the twins on the twin soccer team, my son's soccer team. I met a dad that told me about it, and uh, I took a trip and loved it and, and, and made a huge play, and it, and it panned out. So it's wow. exciting with that. Um, Television and movie stuff, I've been blessed to be able to, you know, know some people t to make the possibility of the, I'm doing the Huey Newton biopic, so I'm producing that. Really? And so I've, um, I've you met- You can play Huey Newton. No, I'm not doing, <laughs> I'm not doing any acting. Like, I have my time in front of the screen, you know, playing, people are tired Were you of in me. black and white back in the day? Yeah. Were you in that? No, the only thing I did was, um, what was that movie with Kevin Hart? Uh, Kevin Hart and, uh, where they go to Las Vegas, I can't even remember the name. Was uh, that with so Ice think, Cube? Think about a man or us. Uh, oh, think like a man. Think like think a man. Think part two. Uh, think forget, like a man. Hey, part forgive me, man. I didn't mean to mess up. Yeah, but think like I just. I'd rather be behind the camera. You know, I want to okay. make like I want to make stuff, and you know, I, I'm more of the creative side of it. So. But, uh, so you your know. biopic, you you coming up with the whole, you're We're not doing just putting forth the money. No, no, I'm not putting any. No, it got funded, so we got the full funding. You know, we got a. Uh, a significant amount of money to make it. We, we've got a script. Um, you know, we've we've attached actors and actresses to it already. Uh, we're in the process of hunting out a director. Um, Deion Taylor is a friend of mine from Sacramento. He's he's a young and up and coming uh, black director. Ryan Krugler is a friend of mine. He played college football with my brother at Sac State. Okay. So he used to hang out at my house all the time in Sacramento. So. Um, you know, he's back out here now just off the, off the Black Panther success, okay. you know, so I'm gonna w waiting in line to talk to him. And we have a few other people that we're talking to, so I'm not someone that tries to jump in this game and, and like think I know everything because I play basketball. I'm someone that wants to learn, so I'm surrounding myself with the best possible team, you know, yeah. with, the, with the best directors and script writers and everyone because I, I've developed relationships. And uh, to really just do this, proner, uh, this project honor. Um, like I said, I met with Frederica Newton, which was his wife, right. just in Oakland uh, last week. I posted on Instagram, sat down and had lunch with her and just was shocked. I told her, you know, I've got a chance to meet Obama, Michael Jordan, Magic, and like no one kind of moved me, but sitting down and talking to Huey Newton's wife, like had me as a fan, like wow. kind of like stumbled up. So it was, it was really That's cool, great, yeah, man. really cool. When do you think that might be? Uh, in we're we're in the, like I said, we, we, right before we sat down, I was on the phone with my partner. We have four LOIs in, LOIs in right now. So we got some, some letters of intent. We're meeting with our first director on Thursday night. Um, okay. So we're in the process. We're gonna try to be up and filming by the summertime. That's great, man. That's so great. it'll be back in Oakland. We're gonna make it everything as rigid and, and authentic as we can make it. And uh, like I said, do, do, the, do the project honor. How much different is what you're finding in your research for the film from, you know, we seen the movie Bl The Panther, uh -huh. not, not Black Panther, but mm -hmm. Panther that was made, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. I just think ago. that um, any time, uh, you know, a group of black men that are bearing arms and, and, and fighting for justice is always going to be a negative stereotype. It's just mm -hmm. the society we live in. Um, you know, obviously Huey did, uh, you know, did bad things and got addicted to drugs and did, he was human, just like yeah. we were human. You know what I mean? Everyone is human. You know what I mean? When, when you take on this form of a leader or, or, or an athlete or something, people forget that you're still human. You yeah. know what I mean? So there were ups and downs like everyone else, but I think to really just show the good and the bad. You know, you got to give them what they, uh, you know, what they know of them, but then also show the other sides of them. And I think that's what we're going to try to do is really just bring him him to life as a whole. <clears throat> now you you read a lot. You do a lot of reading. You I'm starting to read up on this. I just I, that was my goal after I retired to just stay off Instagram. As, less Instagram and more reading. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. So it's just something I've been picking up. I'm reading um, the new Jim Crow right now. That's um, a great book. I'm doing, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm doing Huey research constantly just to kind of get to know him better. But now, when you <clears throat> play, or not even now, do you encourage a lot of players to? do what you've done as far as using their platform to well, meet I, people? I, I think it's different because I was always, you know, I always knew my role and I think that's why I played as long as I wanted to because I knew I was a role player. But I always 
gravitated and hung out with the stars. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Every team, I was the closest friends with the star. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I don't think some of these younger guys got the, I, I always knew that, yeah, I made good money and I could sit probably for a certain amount of time and be fine, but it was just never my mentality. I knew that I was gonna have to, I was gonna be able to do business when I was done. Mm -hmm. But some of these guys are making 20, 30 million dollars a year on the court and then they got their, their shoe deal and they're just thinking like, I'm making, and, and they're right, I'm making 30, 40 million dollars or 20 million dollars, well, however much you're making off the court. Like, I don't want to do any of that right now. Yeah. But they don't realize that they could be making that much, if, more, if not more, off the court. Yeah. Because everyone is so into NBA as a whole. You know what I mean, our faces, our brand, our, our, you know, how we carry ourselves, everything. Like, people are always watching and people always want. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So you're making all these this, this great money on the court, but you can be killing it off the court, too. And I think it takes them a little bit of time to understand that. Do you want to do anything in basketball? Coach, GM, no, I want to. I would like to be so, like a guy that can travel around and teach current players how to understand what, what they can do off the court outside of basketball, the okay. business side of it, being able to brand yourself in the communities and being able to take the meetings with the CEOs of the towns you're in and the cities you're in and make them understand the power they have because these people that we're meeting, they're fans of us. Yeah. You know what I mean? Their kids love us. So they would love to, no matter how busy they are, who it is, they're going to sit down and take a meeting with you. You know what I mean? So just, I would like to do something like that where I'm just kind of putting these guys up on game because it was taught to me and, and now I'm able to use it and it, it's amazing. I'm going to make so much more money off the court than I ever made on the court. Wow. You know what I mean? So it's just like, and I was, I was a journeyman role player. Mm -hmm. So imagine if some of these stars really started putting that grind to how yeah. I'm doing it, it's, come on, man. LeBron seems to LeBron's do on it. Yeah. LeBron is, there's guys on it. Don't yeah. get me wrong, Karan Butler's on it. There's guys that are really business savvy, but like I said, some of these guys, because they're making so much money right now, they don't think about what's next. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Um, Another news peg you made, you boycotted <laughs> McDonald's because Sharif O'Neal, Shaq's son, didn't make the All-American all team, McDonald's All-American team. What's the update on the ban? It was never a ban. I'm just, I, I just like to talk trash and, and make people like say wow. So like, every, like people sometimes think like, he's crazy. Everything I do is strategically, I know the outcome before it happens. Sometimes I'm going to get in trouble and I realize it and I, I weigh the options like the Fisher fight. I knew eventually something was going to happen. But it was just principle, you know what I mean? So I know like when I say something that people are like, wow, like, oh, he's great. Like, no, it's thought of, you know what I mean? <laughs> I wanted people because I knew it was going to make all the blogs and everyone's going to laugh and talk about it. But no, my kids love the chicken nuggets there. So <laughs> we don't, I mean, we try not to give it to them as much, but yeah. I think my, my kids would probably try to beat me up if I said, if I really said no more nuggets. <laughs> but you know, I, I got a chance to meet Sharif when, when Shaq and I played in Phoenix. And, you know, we spent holidays together back when he was little, you know, when yeah. he was like my boy's age. So to be able to see him go and develop and, and, and be, you know, a, a top talent and, and now luckily going to UCLA now, I just, uh, you know, I got love for, for Big Shaq and obviously for Sharif. I want to go back to you um, <clears throat> with the businessmen that you've met through the game. How do you know, like, were you always a really good student and you just, you learned that stuff in high school and college? Or how do you know to what's a good business deal? Do you have advisors uh, or anything? I think more, mine is just like hustle growing up. Like my dad was a drug dealer, you know what I mean? So I just learned that I had just the hustle side of it. Um, I was never a good student because I don't think I applied myself, but I'm, I'm very intelligent. Like when people yeah. talk to me and meet me, they're like, oh, sh like, oh, okay. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. mine is, I can be booked like, a, I mean, quick story. I got caught cheating at UCLA when I was in college and I almost got expelled. So then the next, you know, the next semester, like I was, had to do all my work and, and grind and made B's and, and, and a couple of A's, you know what I mean? So when yeah. I apply myself, I can, I'm just always trying to do so much other things that yeah. school just wasn't exciting to me, you well, know? So mine is just kind of more of a hustle when, when these business things come across. Yeah. So you go by feel and instinct. Feel and, right? and, and the people I'm working with. And to me, like you have to enjoy the people you're working with. Like not all money is good money. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I, yeah. I, I know that and I've learned that. And because I want someone that believes in the vision, I want, if I'm with you, I want, I want to believe in the vision like you, so I'm going to work just as hard as you do to make it grow. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But if I don't get along with you and uh, the project is whatever, like it's just, I'm all off, like I said, energy and vibe when it comes to business and obviously a, a quality product. I've always said there's a difference <clears throat> between being educated and intelligent. And I've told people, and I, I, to be honest, I thought about that after 
dealing with so many players mm-hmm. who might not have a degree mm-hmm. or whatever, but they're uh, intelligent. Come on, man. You know what I'm saying? The, the, I mean, LeBron didn't even go to college. Yeah. And look at all that. Yeah. Like, he's a very business savvy man. You yeah. know what I mean? So I, I think I have a bit. I mean, I'm, I'm educated. Don't get me wrong, but I'm more intelligent and just common sense, street, mm-hmm. street. You know the streets. I was yeah. raised in you know in a street and in a hustle game. So, what you mentioned UCLA. What do you think about <laughs> all this stuff now with the NCAA and the scandal? The NCAA is. I mean, they they've been crooks. You <laughs> mean to be honest with you? And don't get me wrong. They saved a lot of lives and given us a lot of us a career that we wouldn't have had a chance to do. Yeah. So we at the same time, it, it's there's a lot of gratitude and respect. But if you think about how much money they're making off college athletes, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's ridiculous the amount of money they're making in football and basketball. And I remember when I was at UCLA, and you hear these stories all the time. I mean, sometimes you don't have, like, I got $20 a week off my dad's credit union debit card. That's, that's the it. only outside money I had at UCLA. Could you work? I didn't and, have time because okay. I had to be a student and an athlete. So you, see you don't have time, really right? Like, you gotta right, like you student. gotta you gotta focus. You gotta do, and then not to mention I'm in LA at 17 and playing the UCLA basketball. See, so there's a nightlife to it yeah. too. You know what I mean? So like, there's just it's hard. It's it's a lot. You know what I mean? So if you're making all this money, how can you not pay these kids? And then you think about I read an article one day too that 99% of college athletes don't go pro. Oh, yeah, Think about yeah. that. 99% of college athletes don't go pro. So you're trying to say, like, we're student athletes for four years and then we don't go pro and we're just going to just fall on our, you know, fall down, like, with mm-hmm. no help. So I, I think they need to be paid something, met some maybe a creative way to maybe, like, when you're done with college, get the money or, yeah. or just something. You know what I mean? But don't just leave them hanging because they're bringing the schools millions and millions and millions upon uh, millions of dollars. And... Uh, you know, unless you go pro, you have nothing to show for it. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. You mentioned Derek Fisher, that that whole fight. Now, you were saying recently you guys are cool now. Everybody. Yeah, we're fine. Yeah. So how did that kind of, because obviously that's a personal situation. How did uh-huh. it come to be where you could be like forgiving my guests and be like, um, yo, we good? I just think the situation of, you know, Max and I separated. You know, I, I ended up divorcing her. I just think the situation ran its course. So I wasn't in love with her anymore. I love her and I still love her. She's the mother of my children. I'm gonna, from that standpoint, there's always gonna be love, but just as far as like someone that I wanted to continue to grow with or grow old, it just wasn't there anymore. So when the situation- even when you- Even after we, yeah, after we had split, you know. Okay. So that's the whole thing when people are like, well, you're jealous or Derek stole her from you or you're not over it. It wasn't that. That had nothing, it had something to do with it, but what it was was, you know, you're around my kids without telling me. Mm-hmm. That's what, but you're in the house that I pay for, first of all, with my ex, mm-hmm. which is whatever. <laughs> but you're around my, my Isaiah and Carter. And you know, you know, because we were teammates, how much those boys mean yeah, to me. He knew him probably yeah, as Yeah, he already. As a friend, Come on, yeah. man. Oh, he was, they were, we were teammates. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's my whole thing. So when I approached him, because <clears throat> we've seen each other several times, there was just no conversation. He would look down, look away, walk away, whatever. Because he would be at he, my kids. Did he treat you differently? No, he, we he just cold? didn't speak. Oh, really? Because he, so he would be at my kids. Like, he would up? be at my kids' games. You know what I mean? So because you know him and my ex are together still. Okay. So he'd be at my kids' games and just there would be nothing. I'm just thinking this is you know, at some point we got oh, to talk. Oh, this is since, since the fight. Since the yeah, no, since the fight. fight. Since because okay. I didn't know that's I, the, I, the day I found out was the day we fought. So had you seen him many? You know, like when he's dating your ex-wife. Had you seen him and yeah, just no, been I, like I, everything I, was cool? I've, like, I've seen him plenty of times uh, uh, because, like I said, I see him at my kids' games, uh-huh. but there was just no no conversation, yeah. you know, which was, and, and to me, what got me, like, what made me be like, and I was cool with that, like, I wasn't tripping, like, it, it was what it was, yeah. I'm not, like, keeping you guys from each other, like, we fought, and I explained why we fought, and that's what it was, you know what I mean, but just seeing him around, and then my boys really took a liking to him, you know what I mean, and, you know, daddy, I want, we want you and Derek to be friends, and he's a good guy, and I knew, Outside of the movie pulled, he was a cool dude. Like yeah. I said, we were teammates. Yeah. You know what I mean? And Fish was Fish was a cool dude. You know what I mean? So the fact that the boys liked him, and I was just like, I would probably saw him like seven to ten times. It was nothing. Wow. And so this one time after the boys' football game, I just stopped him. You know, and my ex was there too, and I just pulled him to the side and explained why I fought him, and he understood. 
And uh, he apologized, and you know, I, so I apologized for letting it escalate to a fight, but it just, you know, kind of was what it was. I, like I said, I explained that the fact, it wasn't the fact that it was my ex, it was the fact that you're in my house with my kids, mm -hmm. and you don't mm -hmm. tell me. That's the whole thing. So, I mean, like I said, my th whole thing now is he and I are cool. I actually communicate better with him than I do with my ex. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I want them to be happy. You know, like I said, it's about my kids now. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So he makes my kids happy, I'm happy. So that, I mean, that's really wow, all that's, that is. That's, that's, that takes a lot, man. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, and I hit him with some real stuff. Like, you're around my kids more than I am. You know what I mean? Like, I, that's how yeah. deep, like, I'm, I'm a man about it. You know what I mean? Like, you're a, the man figure in their life more, because the mom, Gloria has it more than I do. Yeah. So you're going to have to teach them how to be men and how to maneuver and, and discipline them in the right way. Like, I gave a lot of, considering everything that went down, like, yeah. I gave them a lot of respect from that standpoint. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. when I'm not around, you're the man around. I mean, that's how real I kept it with them. So, like I said, <clears throat> I just want to co-parent and be happy and, and do everything possible to make these boys have the best childhood of their lives and grow up to be productive men. How close were you and Fish? I mean, were y'all just cool teammates? We were teammates. Were we were like cool. Boys? You know what I mean? Like, if you look back, like, he came to our events. You know what I mean? We met his wife. Yeah. Lori and his wife were cool. Like, it was, it was yeah. some ill, like, just the unspoken rule shit you don't do. Yeah, Can I? Yeah. Can nah, I say it's cool. that? Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just something you don't do. You know what I mean? So, we had hung out. You know, he was he was he was my you know he was my OG. Really, he was an older player on my team. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, and I'd always respected him before. There was always love before, because like I said, he's a stand-up dude. So, when it went down, it was funny. But like I said, it's you can't help who you fall in love with or whatever yeah. the situation is. There's just a, a you, there's a respectful way to handle it, and neither of them handled it that way. So, what I did happen. Yeah. Nah, that's <clears> that's that's good, man. All right, so um, your former one of your your former teammates, uh, Austin Rivers, you called him a fake tough guy and arrogant. Why you feel that way? I don't remember calling him fake, a fake tough guy. That's not not, not something I really say. But I okay. said I did say arrogant, and, and because he is, you know what I mean. And that's just who he is. He, I mean, if you ask him, I was the first one to put my arm around him uh, when he got to L.A. and just said, "No, you, you need anything." You know, L.A. is so much more than basketball. And I, I mean, so I, obviously, I think Austin realized that now. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're getting hit every different direction every day because that's what people are doing. Like whether it's you know people that don't like you, people that like you, the media loves you, hates you. It's just a lot going on. The mm -hmm. nightlife. Like you have to really be able to focus and lock in. And that was just the one thing I put my arm around. I'm like, yo, this is LA. It's crazy. If you need anything, let me know. We could talk through it, have lunch, or whatever. So I was, so I did that. But just seeing him and. Being around him, it's just, he's just an arrogant dude. And he rubs some people the wrong way. Like, I didn't trip because he was my teammate. So, like, if he got into it, I got into it. I still mm -hmm. had his back to the fullest, just like I had everyone else's back. But just after not being on his team and then seeing kind of the same way he carries himself and talking trash to players while he's hurt, like, I, I just know, you know what I mean? I yeah. already know what that's about. <laughs> so I see why them dudes were mad. Like, I get it. Yeah. It doesn't make him a bad, it's just who he is. Like I said, we were cool with teammates. I mean, you could ask him. And he, I ain't got nothing bad to say about him from that standpoint. But it's just, <clears throat> he carries himself with the arrogance that a lot of people don't like. Now, you were on the Clippers team when y'all beat Golden State. And then the next year, in the playoffs, the next year they start, they just go to a whole nother level. <clears throat> what was your, like, I, I thought y'all had championship type talent. We had a, a, there's no question. Our, our, the Clippers' biggest weakness was our mental toughness. Uh, physically, on paper, in the games, we could beat anybody. Mm -hmm. Our biggest obstacle and what held us back from a championship was our mental toughness. There was just too many, <clears throat> too many egos. Um, some some young acting, some, some young acts. And, <clears throat> you know, the transition from Vinny to Doc. Yeah. Um, there was just things that, just, that didn't get ironed out. But if they were ironed out, there was no question that we were one of the most talented teams in the league during that time. I remember when <clears throat> Vinny was the coach, everybody was killing Vinny. Mm -hmm. Like he needs to go and all that. And I thought <clears throat> when Doc came... That y'all, you know, I thought he was gonna take y'all to the next level. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I predicted y'all go to the finals that first year with Doc. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and now I've wondered if Vinny had stayed coach, what would have happened? Tough. What do you think? Could y'all have maybe gone further? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> two different coaching styles. I liked Vinny. Vinny was kind of an old throwback coach from the standpoint of 
if he trusts you, he's going to let you go out there and rock. Mm-hmm. And he trusted me. I got his trust the first year. And even though I didn't start, I was playing a lot of minutes and closing games. Um, and then Doc came in, and Doc definitely installed more toughness in us, more of a defensive mindset. <clears throat> Doc wasn't putting up with um, the young acting bullshit that, yeah. w- that we had, which I liked. <clears throat> um, But like I said, I just think there was just too much, um, how do I word this? Cause I mean, all these guys are still my friends. I just, yeah. I'm just always yeah. gonna keep it real. Um, there was just too much, <laughs> there was too much head button. You know what I mean? There was just, there was, just, reports, there was Chris and yeah. Blake just. There was too much head button. And, and, but like I said, even when they say Chris and Blake or DJ and Chris and Blake or whoever they say, like, we're still like brothers though. You know what I mean? Like, it's like a, when you're going to cuss your brother out, but still you love him and you're going to so hug him all, when you're were, done. Were, were guys cool off the court? Guys were cool off the court. Okay. You know what I mean? But just like I said, it was just in, when, when you're, you're in that competitive nature, you know, some guys just aren't receptive to certain things or they take it the wrong way and it becomes a rift. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And there was just too much of that. You know what I mean? So that was, that was definitely what held us back from at least competing for a championship because we were one of the most talented teams out there. When you saw Golden State go so far, would you think it must have really <sighs> ate you up? Man, we just beat them the year before, yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Then we were supposed to play them where we up 3-1 on Houston, oh, Houston that yeah. year and basically got swept after, you know, going into the fourth quarter up 17. Yeah. I mean, I think that was the beginning of the end for that Clipper team, that, that run, because the year before we, you know, we tricked it off, I want to say, against OKC um, when we should have made a run. And we just couldn't get over that second round hump. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It was crazy. Like we were 3-1 manhandling Houston yeah, I, in, the, in, that, in, that, in that series. Yeah. You know, manhandling yeah. Houston. And knowing that we're about to play the Warriors in the Western Conference Finals. And then all of a sudden, James Harden sits down and their reserves <laughs> destroy us. Yeah. And destroyed us the rest of the game seven in Houston. They might have like beat us by 70 or something like we didn't even have a chance you know what I mean like yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I could that was one of the one of the real times in my career I really felt like because you know me I'm balls to the wall every game yeah. if we don't win we could fight like something yeah, like yeah, we're gonna yeah. win you know what I mean so <laughs> but that was really one time in my career where I felt that momentum shift like damn like they they got and the mo- they know. got the mojo and we couldn't get it back wow wow couldn't get it back wow yeah that was so that I was hard I had, well, I, I had some tough times in losing in the playoffs with the Clippers because we were so talented. You mean, mm-hmm. but we just couldn't get it here. And it, it would kill me because I'm so much about team and getting guys on the same page. Like if you ask those guys in that locker room, I was the glue guy that was the communication when some guys were on the islands. Okay. You know what I mean? So it was just like once I bounced and I would just see stuff like watching them as a fan, I'd just be like, I already know what I already know what's going yeah, on tonight. Man. I already yeah. know what's going on tonight. This shit ain't gonna wow. work. Wow. Were you surprised when Chris left? Yeah. Um, mixed feelings. And I wanna get to when Blake left too. Um, but you know, Chris just wanted to win. You know what I mean? And Chris is I think sometimes received the wrong way, but as just someone that you wanna go out and compete with in, in, in the foxhole with you want CP on your team. Mm-hmm. Um, so to see him <clears throat> to see him go was tough. But at the same time now when I talked to him and I, I just saw his family a couple of weeks ago, like he looks so happy out there. Yeah, and I, and, I'm, and if, for, as a friend of his, I'm happy for him. You mean, but of like, there's three teams that really have a, a hold on my heart that I play for in the NBA and it's the Lakers, Clippers, and Warriors. You know what I mean? Right. So I'm always gonna be fans of those teams. So to, to be a fan of the Clippers still, then I'm, no, I'm done playing it, it would hurt me to see Chris go. But um, I think to even touch back to your point earlier, you know, playing with the passing point guard, I think DJ realized how important Chris was. Yeah. You know what I mean? The Clippers yeah. as a whole realized how important Chris was. You yeah. know what I mean? Because if he wasn't, Chris is someone that can take over the fourth quarter by himself and score 20, or he can make sure that we have a 40 point quarter as a team. Like Mm -hmm. Chris could do either or, and they don't have that no more. Yeah. You know, DeAndre's not getting those easy lobs that he took for (laughs) granted, but Chris would throw that like this, you know what I mean? But because Chris is a a, a Hall of Fame once in a, you know, lifetime type point guard. Do you think the Rockets can beat Golden State? (sighs) (laughs) I love what the Rockets are doing, man. I love what the Rockets are doing. I love. Joe Johnson, uh, P.J. Tucker, um, Bob Mute, Chris, because I think Chris is 
make James raise his level. Yeah, James. I love Trevor. You know, Trevor's my young boy that I'm in a group text with now. Eric Gordon is a monster. Clint Capella's understanding why DJ loved Chris yeah. on the office, offensive end so much because Clint Capella's what leading the league in field goal percentage yeah. now and about to get a lot of money because the way he James is. and Chris <laughs> passed the ball. You know what I mean? So I love Houston, but what to me still gives the Warriors the edge is their chemistry. Okay. Their chemistry is second to none. So you can build an amazing team on paper. And the Rockets, I think, have found their stride. They're going to continue to get better. I hope they stay healthy because I would love to see that Western Conference Finals. But the Warriors are just different, man. When I, and you're around that team yeah. and you've been to practice. And it's just somewhere like you want, like you can't wait to go to practice. Like you enjoy hanging out and talking with your teammates on and off the court. Just the energy is amazing over there. I mean, they, we played music when we warmed up. And, you know, you're, you're getting warm, but you're, you're messing around a little bit. Yeah. And just it's more like a it's a fun experience. You know, it, it, it takes kind of the job side of it away. You right. know what I mean? It kind of makes you like to the peer side, like just basketball. Like I'm out here with my homeboys, like about to hoop. You wow. know what I mean? And that's what the Warriors organization gives you. So <clears throat> I love Houston. I mean, say you can never count San Antonio out. Yeah. OKC, okay, if they get hot, can do anything. But um, to me, I'm still picking the Warriors. So the Warriors, the atmosphere you were just describing, you never felt that anywhere else? I felt it the first time around in Golden State, but we weren't ready for it. Okay. We didn't know what it was. Management wasn't ready for it. Like, we had a bond on a different type of level that this team has. But we had it was just, it was crazy. But it was a bond, you know what I mean? But I felt maybe it's the city. You know what I mean? Maybe it's the city that gets behind you because the city is so proud of you and they you always want to put on for the city. But um, those two Warrior teams were the two closest teams I've ever had where there was no ego from any of the stars and everybody just wanted to win. What was it like? Because you, when you went there, they had KD and <clears throat> Steph and those. Like, how, what was that dynamic like? I mean, you got two probably of the top three players in the, in the world. It was amazing to see that everyone just wanted to win, despite what you mentioned. You know, and, you know, Coach, Coach Kerr is a, is a rock star in his own sense, you know, mm -hmm. from being one of just a cool, laid back, someone that the players like because he speaks up not only about basketball, but life in general, mm -hmm. to, you know, the good guy. So everyone had their own little, on, not, they didn't travel in entourage, but they all had their big own fan bases, you know what I mean? So to bring all those guys under one roof and be able to get them to just want to play basketball for one another and love each other and know that the common goals and we all do our jobs, we're going to win a championship is amazing. You, know, you got KD who's the MVP, you got Steph who's the MVP, you got Clay who's going to go down as one of the greatest shooters ever. You got Draymond who is an underdog, but to me, if you lose him, there's no Warriors. You know what I mean? Mm. So you got so many different amazing aspects to that team and they can come together like this for the common goal. Of them. Is Draymond the inspirational leader? There's no question. For the whole organization, <laughs> really? not just the team. He holds everybody accountable. Like, I, he talks shit to the owner. He'll say something to the coaches, to the management. <laughs> he'll get in Steph's ass, he'll get in KD's ass. And that's what you need. You need someone that, because in this game, there's so many people that are, you know, yes men to you in this. Mm -hmm. And that's not how you, you know, this is, we're men, this is not how you're going to make it work. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? You need real in your life. And, Draymond gives them all real, and he also gives us just a sense of I got your back type situation. That's why he and I bonded so well, and we still talk, <clears throat> you know, weekly almost. It's just like we, the way we have our teammates back and, and, and the confidence they have when we're out there on the court with us is just like it, it's, you know, you can do your job because anything else I got. Yeah. And Draymond, you know, Steph, do your job. Katie, do your job because anything else I got. You know what I mean? So when when the me <clears throat> when we see him on TV yelling at teammates or whatever, and the media responds like, "Oh, they gonna get tired of that." No, they don't know. It's not. No, anything. Draymond is probably one of the most loved person in that locker room. <laughs> you know, to me, Draymond is gonna be someone like a, and this is no disrespect because Chuck's intelligent, but just a, a different form of Chuck, like just a more versed version mm -hmm. of Charles Barkley when he's mm -hmm. done playing. Like he's a, he's a very personable, very well-spoken, articulate, can hold conversations in, in any realm of life. Uh, you know, he's just a real deep dude, but what you see is a competitor like you saw of me. Yeah. So you're gonna see me cussing the other team out, <clears throat> getting a tackle foul, yelling at my teammates sometimes, or getting back and forth with my teammates, or getting into my coach, because we're just passionate. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we're still the person that, you know, everyone rallied around. Now you, 
had a rep. You mentioned it earlier, thug, tough guy, you know, bully. You had that reputation as one of the tougher guys in the league. How do you think that came about? Um, I just, <laughs> it's funny because I think because people think like because the way I look, you know, they because I've been called a pretty, a pretty boy, boy you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. But people don't know the way I grew up, you know what I mean? Like I said, my dad was a drug dealer, so I've seen my dad do some crazy stuff, you know what I mean? And my dad always fought. And the one thing he taught me at an early age was protect your family at all costs. So if my brother or sister got in a fight, I fought no matter what. Yeah. And if I didn't, I was going to get my ass whooped when I went home. So mm -hmm. I just grew up fighting, always. You so know what I mean? you got in a lot of fights. Lots of fights. And then when I first started going to school, so we lived in a bad neighborhood, but my parents always put me in white schools, and I didn't like it at the time. I'm, 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 I'm Italian and black, okay. but I consider myself a black man because of the way I've been treated and, and, and the path I've taken with the racism I yeah. faced. But my parents would put me in white schools, and I didn't like it because I used my friends were Mexican and black, and I didn't really know how to, you know, verse with, with white kids early on, like third grade, I can remember when I first got to Sacramento, and it was just, <clears throat> I wasn't white enough and I wasn't black enough, so I was just always fighting. And how I really started be getting accepted was because I was the best at all the sports. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I was always the best at everything, so that's when people kind of gave me a chance to even be accepting of me, and then once they got a chance to know me, it was, I still have friends from third grade. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. So it's just, once they gave me a chance, so I've just always, grew up rough and then I just hap <laughs> happen to look like this, you know what I mean? So people are, oh, he's fake or he's this, he's that. Yeah. And like, but the people that grew up me and know me just like, no, Matt is the one that will fight in a heartbeat. And it's not, it's just, it's not something I'm proud of. I'm not the toughest guy by any means, but it's just the way I was raised. And yeah. like, my whole, like just, I'm a big on respect. Like respect me and I'm respect you. You know what I mean? And like I said, I'm not the toughest guy, but we're all men at the end of the day. So even if I'm gonna take an L, like you're not gonna disrespect because we'll, we'll probably, Go, yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, so it's, yeah. just, it's just the way I, I grew up. I, I'm, I'm working on it. I hope that I hope that the Fisher fight is my last fight. But I just, you never know in life. How many fights were you in in the NBA? Like real fights? None, because no one really wanted to fight. No, okay. no. And you got to think all the all the altercations. Because they knew you were tough. But or all just the, I just I don't know. But all the altercations I always got in was coming to someone's defense. Yeah. You know what I mean? No one ever really just came at me on no bully stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I never came on no one on no bully or thug types. I was just competitive. So if, if you got mad, it's just because I'm in your ass guarding you and I'm not giving you nothing easy and I'm going to foul you hard if you beat me. Like, yeah. that's what I was on. I wasn't on no, I'm going to try to fight. You know, I was yeah, never yeah, on yeah, that. Yeah, but, yeah, like, yeah. if the basketball stuff wasn't, if, if, it had, if it went there, I would be ready to go there. How, how common <laughs> are fights in the NBA, like in practice and stuff? Not really that much. There are people who will fight, obviously, but at the end of the day, like, especially in practice, that's your teammate. That's mm -hmm. your brother. You know what I mean? So it does go there sometimes. There are fights in practice. You know what I mean? It happens. But at the end of the day, it just, it's so expensive now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's expensive hey, to fight, it? man. That first punch can cost you, for me, the, that first punch, if I ever threw a first punch, the NBA probably would have had me arrested <laughs> on the low. But there's no telling what the fine would have been. You know what I mean? But back in the day, it was just different. It was almost like, you know, not hockey, but to an extent where, you know, in the 80s, they would throw hands or oh, elbows yeah. and it would just be a technical foul. Oh, you know yeah. what I mean? And they would be able yeah. to come back in the game. Yeah. But like I said, everything evolves and grows and it, it wasn't good for the brand or the image. So I get it. But, um, yeah, there's, I mean, <laughs> it's whatever. Another news item. <laughs> now, this one, I, I'd be interested to see if this is still applicable. This is from 2016, where you obviously were still playing. And I read something that said, you don't, you don't like Colin Kaepernick. Now, is that true? Is that still true? What, what's the, um, what's we the root just, of that? We had just went through some... Um, some personal stuff, I guess. So you knew him? We've never, uh, we, kn we knew each other in passing, but just some, some crazy stuff that went down. And I didn't like the way he handled himself with the situation as a man. Okay. So I just let him know that, yeah, I was, at the time, I was, I was on some other, uh, some other thinking. Yeah. Um, but now that time has passed, I'm a fan of him. So that was before the whole yeah. protest. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm a fan of just him as a man now. Like I said, I didn't, the move, the move that was pulled back then was on some other stuff. But yeah. now just, I think the movement he caused and, and the courage he had and the, and the, and the, and the, the inner strength and peace, I guess he had with what he did is amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, he's going to go down as a legend now. Yeah. You mean, which, which is dope. And uh, 
he really sparked a movement and a conversation that was that was a sticky conversation for so long, and it's still sticky. You know what I mean? But yeah. he, you know, for, to, to, in order for things to change, you have to make people uncomfortable, and that's what he did. And, and I, I think I speak for everyone when I when I thank him for that. Have you reached out to him? Or I would like to. Any? Like I said, the, the last. Uh, I think the last he knew that if if I saw him, you know, it was gonna, you know, we were gonna have a, you know, but like I yeah, said, I'm, I saw I'm, I'm, the I'm, quote. I'm, yeah, I'm off that now. Like I would love to sit down and talk to him because I'm on the same type thing, you know, with this whole social injustices and you know, if you if you follow me on Instagram or follow me as a person, you just know I'm always speaking up on everything. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, I was doing that before he was before he did his stance, but like I said, I, I respect the stance he's taken for all of us. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I would love to sit down and have a conversation with dude and, and, and you know, do something foundation wise or for the city or, or, or do something together because I think we're always stronger together, yeah. uh, you know, than we are separate. Is there anything more, you see a lot of athletes speaking out now. Is there <clears throat> anything more you think should be done by athletes? Um, it, 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 it's, it's, t- it's tough because the big guys, you know, have to worry about their image Mm -hmm. and their brand. And someone like me could sit back and talk shit all day. And it's just, (laughs) you know, like I said, because I I mean, I know who I was. I mean, I have a following, but I'm not by no means. I'm no LeBron. I'm no Steph. You know what I mean? So someone could sit like back, back, someone like me could sit back and talk all day. But when LeBron steps up and does it, that's that's big. You know what I mean? When Steph takes a stand and has Trump coming at him, that's big. And when other athletes take stand when Kaepernick takes stand it's you know it, it's groundbreaking and it, and it needs to happen because together we are pop culture as a yeah. whole whatever athletes in general with basketball to, to the forefront because of our faces and how we're everywhere like we lead culture in fashion in luxury and yeah. in, in in business and you know anything we do you know what I mean? When you when you start adding the Jay Z's and the Puffs, like we are pop culture. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, whatever we do, makes way. So when we start coming together, um, it's big. Now, what is you mentioned, Steph? What's he like? As what's he like? As, I don't know if people. Steph is a cool know, dude. You know, I, I think, I think Steph gets a, a, a misconception of who Steph is. Um, as a person, kind of like how Blake Griffin did. Okay. Like you saw Blake Griffin, he was kind of like whatever on these commercials, and people would always ask like, what's Blake like? Yeah. And Blake is cool as shit. Like Blake is <laughs> just like, talks trash and has a good time, and you could have fun with Blake. And Steph is the same way. Steph is like a, a, a serious practical joker. Like him and Ian okay. Clark last year, all like, the, when I think back about that season, I just remember him and Ian just laughing the whole season. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, as amazing as he is, he just doesn't, you know what I mean? He still enjoys life. You know what I mean? And just a fun, same kind of, you can, you know, you could talk trash, you talk trash back. Uh, he'll go golf with you. Like, mm-hmm. he's just a regular dude. And I think, uh, like I said, when you become a superstar, people think you're, you know, that you're off or you're different. And the same with even like KD. KD is quiet to the public, but when he's around us, he's cool and talking trash and, yeah. you know, trying to be funny, trying to be funny. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's just, those dudes are cool. Now you mentioned Blake, uh, the trade from the Clipper. Were you shocked at that? Upset about I was, that? Or? Same thing with Chris. Like I'm just like, damn, as a Clipper fan, like. Ah. But then, then you start thinking too on the business side of basketball and just basketball as a whole. I think, you know, Blake needed a, a breath of fresh air. Okay. You know what I mean? I think they had probably obviously reached the ceiling with the team they had. So from a business side of it, like as a fan, I was hurt. Like okay. I said, I'm a Clipper fan still. Yeah. But on the basketball side, I know I don't know if he wanted to go to Detroit because it's freezing. He's been in LA his whole <laughs> career, but he got a fresh start. You know, he looks like he's having fun again. He's smiling. He's out there playing well. And then for the Clippers, what they got back is they got nice pieces. Tobias yeah. Harris can really play. Avery Bradley can really play. Who else they get? They got one more person. Uh, though the Avery and they got three Tobias. people, didn't they? Those were the main yeah. two, I believe. But those, like yeah, those, those guys, can, can really yeah. play. You yeah. know what I mean? So I think the trade worked out good for. But I think the Clippers are a better team now with okay. the guys they've added. Um, but like I said, as a fan, it was it was bittersweet to see him go. You mm. said earlier that you you knew who you were. You knew you were a role player. Is that unique? Because a lot of role players don't know they role yeah. play. Like they think if right. I could get those forty if I got minutes, those minutes. If yeah. I could, no, I knew. <laughs> Like my, what got me 14, 15 years was my heart. 
I mean, I could do things and I can shoot and I can play defense, I could do, but I just knew that no one was going to outdo this. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They're not going to outdo that. So I knew my, you know, and I think that's why, like I said, if you think about it, I played on a lot of teams, but I always went in and I started. You, yeah. Any team I've ever gone to from the Warriors last year, I started. You know what I mean? Games. Uh, any team I went to, I started just because I knew what I had to do. You know what I mean? I'm a, like a real student of the game. So I would watch film and see their, their weaknesses and where I can plug the holes and where guys, where the scores like the ball at and how I can pick and like I just studied the game to, if you, if you ask anyone, and this is not like toot my own horn, but people love playing with me because I'm just so selfless to the game and I'm going to mm -hmm. set screens or get you an offensive rebound or hard foul somebody or do whatever it takes to get you going because I know if you go going, we're going to go. Yeah. Yeah. I might mess around and give you 30 points sometimes or give you a nice double-double. Lucky to get a triple double in my career, you know what I mean? I can do all that stuff, but like I said, like there's, I think if guys understood what their role was, they would last longer. Like, yeah, I agree. It, there's two stars on the team, sometimes more now, but you know, the rest guys are role players. Even if you're an all-star, you're still a role mm -hmm. player. You know, mm -hmm. as, as good as Draymond and as good as Clay is, they're role players to Katie and Steph's mm -hmm. superstardom. You know what I mean? But they're still all-stars and making great money, but they understand that, yeah. you know what I mean? So if guys knew what, I always tell people, I was always used to tell people, like young players, when I started becoming older, like go talk to the coach and see what he wants you to do. And then do that. Yeah. He's, tell, he's telling you <laughs> how the hell you gonna get on the court. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it was just, <clears throat> that's what I was always about. I always knew what my job was and what was needed. So that's why anywhere I went, I always played and I was a contributor because you, I knew you, my role. You know being here in LA, everybody's talking about Clay coming to the Lakers. <gasps> Can you see that? I mean, it seems he seems content. <laughs> I can see it. I don't want to see it. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a Lakers. I'm, 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 I'm a Laker fan too, but I don't want to see the Warriors break up. You want to see it again? I think okay. it would be amazing. I want I want LeBron to come to the Lakers next year, and I want Paul George or Boogie to come to the Lakers. Like I want to see the Lakers get back to top. But I love what the Lakers are right now. To me, like the only two people you don't trade are Kuzma and Ball and okay. Ingram is right there. And this is all due respect with the whole team. This is just yeah. me talking trash. But I, I want to see them go. I want to see LeBron come here and finish up, Paul come home or Boogie come here and put them back on top just from the fan. So uh, let's the say side. they get, which is a good realistic <coughs> chance, they get LeBron and George, Paul George. How far are they, can they win it? I don't know. They're going to, I'll tell you this. I don't know if they could win it because you still got to go through Houston, Golden State, but they're going to be a fun team, and it's going to be the best thing ever to happen to Zoe and Kuzma, to have LeBron around you and then another star in Paul George and mm. really teach these guys because what I love about the Lakers is they're just, they're just young because they don't know any better right now, but they don't really have, you know, Coldwell Pope is an older player, but I don't know how vocal he is, but they yeah. don't really have no OGs on that team, and to teach, to put really craft these young guys, and you know, what's weird about the game today is when I came in the game, like, like Chris Webber was an OG of mine. You know what I mean? Guys would tell you stuff to get you better because they wanted to see you do well. It's different now because the older guys are kind of worried about the younger guys. Shit, yeah, if I give job. him this dirt on how to get on the court, he's going to take my job. Yeah, you know what I mean? But yeah. I never looked at it from that cycle. So when I started doing it, I never looked at it from that standpoint because, like I said, no one was going to outdo this. Yeah. So I know I'm going I'm to be on the court regardless. If you, like you got game, I want you to get on the court too. Yeah. You know what I mean? So this is what I'm going to try to help you with. But you don't see that as much anymore because, like I said, I think these older players are scared because they know it's a young player's league. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think these older players are scared of their, their jobs getting taken. And it's disappointing because there's too many young kids out here that are so talented just kind of just doing whatever because they don't have no real older players in their locker room. Like, it's like, no, you don't do that, bro. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Or teaching them how to handle these women or teaching yeah. them how to handle their, you know what I mean? Like, you just don't have that no more. Um, I remember with the Gilbert Arenas, mm -hmm. Javaris Crittenton, remember that situation? Mm -hmm. And they had been gambling on the plane. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Arenas was a max guy. Mm -hmm. Crittenton was making, I don't know, mm -hmm. one and a half million or whatever. And how much do, do can guys get caught up in trying to live the oh, lifestyle yeah. of oh, a, yeah. you know, a superstar who's making dangerous. max and you, you ain't, yeah. One, you just have to know yourself. Know who you are. Like I said, what, Doc Rivers said one thing. He said, you know, be a star in your role. Whatever your role is, be a star in that. Mm. So more than that is just knowing yourself. But to get back to your point, that gambling is... You know what I mean? That's, That's another high state. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? But it, it, most of it, I, we always have fun with it. Yeah. I mean, we did it and it was always fun for us. But, you know, you would win or lose a lot of money. What's the most you saw anybody lose? 
<laughs> you ain't got to name no, names. No, it was me. You want to. No, I oh, lost. No. <laughs> so when I got so when I got traded from the Clippers to the Memphis Grizzlies, I think I owed like CP twenty thousand, BG twenty thousand. <laughs> DeAndre 15, like I was off hey. on the hook. But like I said, it went back and forth. I would be up. Okay. You know, y'all uh, keep a tab. Yeah, right? I mean, you just know, you know, like, damn, I got to. <laughs> man, I hope my wife or my girl or whoever doesn't see this, you know, these transactions. Because then we had a thing, like, if you didn't pay on time, you know, you got taxed and everything. So I got traded and, and I saw him a couple times during the summer, but it didn't cross my mind. But I remember the first time. Memphis came came to the Clippers. I had like these cashier checks for all these dudes. <laughs> oh, I mean, like because yeah, you had to pay up. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean. So it's, but like I said, it was always like it's laughing and it, it was always fun with us. Yeah, you know what I mean. But you know the Gilbert situation got taken too far, and I think that was the the beginning of the end of Gilbert's career. Yeah, yeah. Because do you, do you have any idea? Do you see him? Yeah, He's out I mean, there. you know, we're 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 kind of tied together through sisters. You know, they're That's both right. our exes. Yeah, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean. So I still talk to Gilbert. See Gilbert. Um, you know, but like I said, I just think that situation was, you know, luckily he beat the situation, but then he came back and mocked it and mm-hmm, do that mm-hmm. thing. And then, you know, and then he got hurt, you know, so yeah. when you're not, when, when, you, when he's not, when he wasn't agent zero no more, because when yeah. he was agent zero, he was top oh. five in the world. Yeah. You know what I mean? People don't realize how good Gilbert was when you, when he wasn't agent zero no more and he had a knee trouble and then he gets traded and he has this big contract and he gets traded again and then he gets waived. It's just like, you know, once you're not agent zero, like they're not fooling with you oh, no yeah. more. You know what I mean? So someone as talented as his, if he would have, you know, played the, you know, that whole gun situation hadn't happened and he would have got hurt. He probably could have, because he was so stayed talented, in league, stayed yeah. in the league longer, yeah. you know. But like I said, once you, you kind of start mocking, you know, what you're in trouble for and your talent starts to diminish because of injuries, it's only a matter of time. Yeah. How's he doing? Is he, is he all right? Gilbert is... People think Gilbert is crazy, but Gilbert is, I think, not, I'm not to the extreme, we're not, we're different extremes, I think, but he's still very calculated at the same time. Okay. Very intelligent, very good with his money, very business savvy. Gilbert has a lot of people fooled, but I think he wants some fooled. Because <laughs> Gilbert is very intelligent. Yeah. So he's, yeah. Gilbert's fine, money-wise. What was it like playing with Kobe? Uh, amazing. Really cool, man, especially because the way it came about, you know, uh, it started back, you know, at UCLA when he would come and work out and play and always just thinking. I remember UCLA, I was thinking like, damn, he's only a year and a half older than me. Like, I'm going to have to be able to guard, you know, I'm going to be able to handle that. When I'm yeah, at UCLA, yeah. I'm thinking that when I'm seeing, I remember the one year he broke his right hand. So he was up at UCLA doing all left-handed workouts. And that's the year he came back shooting left-handed all the time. Yeah, yeah. He was doing his whole workout left hand. like, this dude's a monster. You know what I mean? So I was always like, kind of like, man, I got to be ready for him. So he was someone my whole career that I locked in on and always wanted to battle with. Mm-hmm. Every time we went, <clears throat> whether I was playing a lot or got on for a couple minutes, we battled. You know what I mean? So it was always, I think there was a mutual respect there. Then uh, fast forward to Orlando, 2010, and people still talk about this shit in 2018. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the ball fake thing. Yeah. And... Um, that was a crazy game because that was a really good game. Like, that was towards the end of the season. We were going back and forth, but he was just on his Kobe shit, like, elbowing me and grabbing me and doing dirty things. And, like, the refs weren't calling, and it was pissing me off. <laughs> so I just, you know, I was just, I was to the point where, like, okay, we're about to fight. You know what I mean? It's just what it, yeah. what it was. So when I took the ball out, if you watch me, I would, it wasn't premeditated or nothing. I literally just, I don't even know where it came from. I just really ball fake, but if you watch me, I'm looking at Vince come off this pit because I'm trying to hit Vince for a back door on our inbounds play. But for some reason, just I guess my arms had a thing of their own and just <laughs> like faked it. You know what I mean? So once everything happened and I saw the film and saw that it came like within eyelashes of him and he didn't flinch, I'm like, that's a, that's a cold boy right there, boy. You know what I mean? But then, um, you know, then my, my situation in Orlando fell through. And, uh, you know, he was someone that called me up like a couple of days in free agency, you know, and, and asked me if I wanted to be a Laker. And Lakers were my favorite team growing up. Yeah. I'm just like, damn, this is Kobe asking me if I want to be his teammate. Like, <laughs> hell yeah. Like, I was the biggest Magic Johnson fan, <clears throat> you know, and I remember Kobe saying, <clears throat> anyone crazy enough to f with me is crazy enough to play with me. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's how that started. And then I remember just one quick story about when we first went to Spain. Um, because we were going back for Pal, <clears throat> we were playing over there. Everyone was taking their family. He was over there with his headphones on and his little, we had our cubby holes because we were flying overseas. 
and I, I thought he was rapping. I didn't know, cause you know, he had that yeah, that, yeah, that, rap that, that rap album. <laughs> but he was over there just jamming. So I thought he was rapping, and I just got, and then I saw him doing stuff. So I was gonna go, cause I couldn't sleep. So I went over to see what he was doing, and he had a, a bunch of different courts drawn on this piece of paper, and he told me, "I'm looking for where you guys are gonna be open out of the offense." So he says, "I never look at." the guy guarding me, I'm always looking at the help in the, in the half man that have their eyes on me. Wow. I'm like, wow. what the f <laughs> So he's, he, but he had 20 or 30 little courts with diagrams drawn up like where he can pass us the ball at. Wow. And that blew me away, man. I wow. just knew that he was just on a different level. You know what I mean? And then, you know, going out to Orange County and working out with them sometime in the summertime is early morning, you know, tracks, track, track sessions, uh, weight, you know, weight sessions. Like, he was completely dialed into basketball. Mm. You mm. know what I mean? And, and I think that's what, what made him so great. So his, because, you know, his work ethic, his competitiveness is like legendary. It's <clears throat> legit. It is yeah. not a myth. No, I went to his camp one time in Santa Barbara and me and him played these kids two on two. And he was like Kobe game seven against <laughs> these 12 year olds, like blocking shots, dunking really? on them. I, I was like, yo, chill, bro. Like, what? <laughs> no, he was like, no, nah. like, like nothing easy. And like, I was thinking like, these are young kids. Yeah, and wow. he was going, like I said, he was Kobe game seven out there, shot faking them and dunking. I was just like, I, was, <laughs> I just kind of sat back and just gave him the ball. I'd be like, in the real game, I just gave him the ball every time and kind of watched him go to work. But it was just like, that's where his mind was always at. Like when he was between those lines, I don't give a who I'm playing, like it's on. And wow. I love that about him. I remember, remember he had that commercial early in his career where he was putting some little boy who was maybe eight years old that he was playing against and he was blocking his shot and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's real. real. That's real. None, none fake about that. <laughs> all right, all right. Let me ask you this. What was it like to play for Phil Jackson? Amazing, an amazing experience playing for Phil. Um, it was just, he was someone that really put the ultimate trust on you. Like if he went out, the, if you watch Phil, he's never really yelling, he's always mm -hmm. sitting. Like Phil gave you the confidence first as a player, but then the structure to go out there and be men. He didn't, he didn't feel like he needed to control the game. You know, a lot of coaches need to call plays every mm -hmm. time up the floor or this. Like Phil knew what, you know, in the triangle, what you were going to get, where you were going to get it and allow you to play. You know, Phil wasn't someone that called a bunch of timeouts. Like if you were, if the other team was making a run, he wouldn't want to call a timeout and let the place go crazy. Phil would let us work, mentally work through it. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I only got him for a year, which was disappointing. Um, you know, and that's the year I tore my knee too. I, that was my only surgery I had my whole career. So I, I kind of, uh, that was when we, they had won back to back. That was my first year with the Lakers. So we were going for a three-peat that year. Um, and we were playing really well. Uh, I tore my knee. We never really, you know, the team as a, as a whole, we never got a rhythm. We got swept and Dallas won the championship that year. But I really got close with Phil and really found it crazy because when I was hurt, like, like I said, I'm a student in the game, so I'm watching the game. So one time I just text him, like, you know, what I saw from the game and he responded and we went back and forth. I'm like, holy sh like I'm talking to Phil about the game and what he, he asked me what I saw, you yeah, know what I mean? And yeah. he kind of trusted me and I told him and he agreed with me and we talked back and forth. So it was crazy that I went from like, you know, just getting on the team, doing all this stuff, getting hurt, and now I'm like talking game strategy with mm -hmm. Phil Jackson. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really cool. The meditation stuff was cool. It was different. Um, it was just a different vibe, and it, and it worked for him. Probably no other team, I imagine, you had that experience like. Um, no. Yeah, Phil was special. Um, I enjoyed playing for Coach Kerr. Coach Kerr let you play. Don Nelson let us play. I mean, there were some coaches that let us play, and there was other coaches like, you know, Stan Van Gundy that wanted to call a play every single mm -hmm. time. And as players, you don't like that. You know, you want to be able to feel the flow of the game and, and do what you do. Um, so I had a few coaches that kind of let us, let us play. You, um, you've had some great teammates we mentioned earlier. <laughs> Give me the best story about each guy. So Allen Iverson. <sighs> Man. I'm just such a fan of, of who he is as a person. You know, I was there two and a half years with him, and to see the beating he took every night, the way his elbows would be swollen like this, like this mm. is no exaggeration. Like it's why he always had his elbow pads on. He had bursa sacks on his elbows like this, and he's little. You know what yeah. I mean? So he's going up, and that's back when the NBA was still big. Yeah. He's going up against these big dudes every night and um, <clears throat> doing his thing. So I, I would just say my one story, all my best stories with him are, I'm going to say my best story with him is just his resilience, his toughness, and his heart to be able to go out there and do what he did every single night at his size. Okay, okay. Chris Paul. 
Chris was someone I love playing with. <clears throat> one of the favorite, one of my favorite people I played with. One of the most favorite people I played with, because it's just similar to Kobe. Like you just know he's gonna play hard. He's a superstar. that's gonna do every, like play as hard as he can on both sides every single night. And um, it didn't matter how it came. I, I think a lot of things with Chris is the way he comes at you. And mm -hmm. I think that kind of disturbs some guys. But with me, like, it was if he had to cuss at me, it was good. If I had to cuss back at him, it was good. Or if he could say, come on, Maddie. That's what, uh, once, once we got our chemistry down, all he had ever had to say is, come on, Maddie. Mm -hmm. And we were on. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So Chris is someone I love playing with. I think the Clippers understand how important he was now that he's not there. And um, I love that he's, he's doing well with Houston. Steve Nash. Steve. <clears throat> Steve was a really cool dude, too. Um, a quiet dude, a very intelligent guy. Um, a, a thinker. You know, I think obviously he had, had to realize that he was a, you know, a 6'2 white guy. Or how tall is he? 6'4? <laughs> or whatever yeah, he was. You I, I know what I mean? I don't even know if he was 6'2. Maybe yeah, 6 one, You know, whatever, but yeah. a, a little white guy. Yeah. And he made the absolute most of his body. Uh, two time MVP. You know, yeah. arguably one of the greatest shooters, uh, passers ever. Uh, a huge fan of you know, what he accomplished. Shaq. Man, the biggest kid, the biggest <laughs> embodied kid I've ever played with. But amazing dude, man. The, one of the biggest hearts, one of the most kindest dudes. Probably the most dominant player ever in the game, physically dominant player ever in the game. I think Will Chamberlain was amazing, but he played with the guys a lot smaller than him. Mm -hmm. Shaq was, to me, the most physically dominating player ever. <clears throat> But what I remember about Shaq, you know, we, we play with each other in Phoenix. So what I remember about Shaq was more just, it was towards the end of his career, but he was just always laughing and having a good time. Like mm -hmm. Shaq loves life. And I love that about Shaq. How do you, because you were in the league in 04, I think was your uh, first 03, year? 03, 04. <clears throat> so the league's changed a lot. Mm -hmm. Do you think the teams are better now with this whole three-point thing or the bigger teams back then? It's a more? different game. It's a faster pace. You know what I mean? Like the big teams couldn't play this game no more, mm -hmm. but the small teams couldn't play that game no more. But like I said earlier in our, our, our conversation, the goal is to get these 120-point games. You know what I mean? So Steph Curry has changed the face of basketball forever. The stretch four has changed the mm -hmm. face of basketball forever. Like I kind of feel like the center is going to be obsolete unless you're like a um, – unless you're like the boy in uh, New York, or Embiid uh, is special, yeah. you know what I mean? But I think there's gonna be more Przingis's, you know what I mean, then Embiid is a, is a, is a, is a, whew, is a rare town, I hope He's he stays healthy. He's almost a throwback to yeah, some degree. Right, yeah. but then he can still shoot and yeah, handle the ball, yeah. he can shoot threes, and like his coach wants him to shoot six to eight threes, you know what I mean? So yeah. it's just, it's a different time and a different game. So, you know, and, I, and when I talk to older players and fans, you know, we don't like this or they yeah. couldn't, the scoring is different because it's just, and, but it's just a different time. Like if you don't adjust, I'm glad I played when I did. You know what I mean? Because I, I, you still at the beginning with some physicality and it was still, you could do some physical stuff. But now it's just so, you know, three point happy and rip and run and you can't guard no one that I would have just lost my mind or yeah. lost my money <laughs> too. Well, look, man, you've been great before we got you. Anything else you want to get off your chest? Um, no, man, just watch. I got a lot of, a lot of cool um, TV stuff. I got a, I'm doing another, uh, we got the Suge Nightlife rights. So I'm doing a, a death row story with one of the producers of Power. Wow. So, uh, so you're we're, doing we're a lot yeah, with I'm, the producer. Yeah, I'm doing a lot of So is that going to be a movie, a documentary? It's going to be a series. What? A so I, I want I I, I my, my you know my, a friend of mine my best friend Polly she helped me uh, get everything because it's Suge Knight's niece to, to get all the the legal stuff side handled but I always saw it like I'm a huge Pac fan as you can see yeah. and you look at my house um, you know so I always wanted to be able to tell that that death row was such a crucial part of history in, in the music you know mm -hmm. where else did you have Tupac and Snoop and Dr. Dre and yeah. Suge Knight and Warren G and Nate, uh, Nate Dogg and Daz and Corrupt. You know what I mean? It was just yeah, such an amazing yeah, yeah. time. So I always wanted to be able to tell that story from the standpoint of <clears throat> let's do a let's do a series so you can develop every character. Because when you do a movie, like, you know, we talked about the Pac movie before we yeah, on film, yeah. like in 90 minutes, it's hard to tell someone's life story. You know, Straight Outta Compton was a good movie, but how do you tell 15 years of content, 20 years of content in 90 minutes? Yeah. You know, so yeah. I'm a, I was a huge fan of Norcos, and I was just like, I love the way that even though Pablo was a, a dirty dog, they humanized him, and you still cheered yeah. for Pablo at some points. You felt bad for him at some points. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. that's what I really wanted to be able to do with this Death Row thing is really develop every character and, and tell the true story because there's so many myths, and you think about it. I mean, Death Row was 
you know, a two year, like a real two year power run, you know, in, in the midst of the 90s where, you know, they were a half a billion dollar industry in two years, you know what yeah. I mean? So who would have known if, you know, Pac stayed alive and the business stayed, how big they could have been the biggest record label ever, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and being a West Coast dude, that's what I grew up on. So it was just a passion of mine to be able to, to, to have the honor to, to work on that project and, and get the best people, like I said, around me again and uh, do all these people honor. Well, look, man, it's been an honor talking with you. Man, Great stuff. Thank for you, real. man. Appreciate real. it. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming through, man.